why is the most wonderful time of the year? Proven to be so many times for so many people, the most stressful time of the year. Let's look at Matthew, the first chapter. That should be an easy book for you to find. If you've got the New Testament and only the New Testament, then you look at the very first book. If you've got the Bible, then forget the Old Testament and look, turn to the New Testament in chapter 1 of Matthew, verses 18 through 25. Now, the birth of Jesus, many of you know that after we have uh, the, the kickoff of our hanging of the green, most of my messages, all my morning messages will be centered around Christmas, okay? Now, the birth of Jesus was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Jesus, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public figure, was minded to put her away secretly. I'll say something about being her husband there in a few minutes, okay? But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he, meaning Joseph, called his name Jesus. May God add his blessings to the reading, the proclamation, the understanding of his holy and blessed word. The first Christmas, as you can see, certainly had its share of stress. Any of you know what stress is? Any of you have to deal with stress on a daily basis? Maybe I should ask it the other way. Is there anyone here that knows absolutely nothing about stress? I'd really like to have an interview with you today, okay? I want to find out what's going on in your life. I want to find out what the secret is, okay? Chances are, during our Christmas time, there'll be some unexpected interruptions. There's people right now. Uh, in our church that's going through some interruptions in life. Some of those unexpected, maybe some of those brought about through sickness and death, maybe some expected interruptions, but there always seems to be plenty of room for the unexpected interruptions. We look and we see the dashed Christmas plans that we might have had. But we need to look at that as an opportunity for Christian growth. So how are we going to survive the next three or four weeks, okay? What are we going to do? Do we have a game plan? We know that it's a wonderful time of the year, but we also know it's a stressful time of the year. How do we get through that now, with a sense of sanity by year's end? What do we do? Are there some key elements or some ideas from God's Word as to what we need to do and how we need to prepare for it? Well, I think that we can look at a couple of spiritual tips that can help get us through the most wonderful time of the year. The first survival tip that I would like to give you is expect your best laid plans to be interrupted. I hope they're not, but they can be. And we need to be prepared for that. 
You know, Joseph and Mary had been planning a wedding until God comes to them and tells them to start preparing for a nursery. They were planning for a wedding. Now, the Hebrew marriage has two stages. Help you understand this. The first one is the caducian. That's where the engagement takes place. That's where the, but, but, get tongue tied on that one, the betrothal uh, takes place. And, and at this point, in the Hebrew marriage there, they are legally a couple. They are legally married, but they're not living together. But their, cons- their relationship has not yet been uh, consummated. The, that caducian period could last as long as 12 months. Imagine being in a relationship, you're married, but you're not together for the first, possibly the first 12 months. But it is in that point, at that stage, that your fidelity, your integrity is tested. Now, in order to break the engagement, you have to get a divorce. And in our day and time, you don't think about a divorce and an engagement, but it was a different line of thinking there. And then the hoopah, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, That's the marriage ceremony itself. Here was Joseph. He was planning on marrying his little 15-year-old sweetheart. I could just imagine Joseph drawing up those house plans and building their little marriage bed. They had big plans. They had a lot going on there. And then there's Mary. Think in her own way, Mary was planning what could have been a very elaborate wedding, picking out her china patterns and and going to uh, McAlpin's or whatever those places are, uh, trying to find out what kind of of pottery, what kind of china they wanted there, Uh, looking for that perfect honeymoon. Big plans. Here's Joseph. Here's Mary having their own big plans, making their own big plans for a wedding. Now, just try to imagine this, okay? Here is a, what we believe to be about a 15-year-old girl, Mary, going to a 20-something-year-old man by the name of Joseph, who was her fiancé. And Joseph starts talking about floor paint plans and what color to paint the walls, whatever. I'm being a little facetious here. But then Mary says, hold it, honey, hold it, hold it. I'm pregnant. We've got to be changing our plans and focusing in a different direction here. Now, short of a divorce, short of death, short of dismemberment, very few of us will have any kind of interruptions during the Christmas season, quite like what Joseph and Mary experienced. Now, if if God interrupts Joseph and Mary's wedding plans, our plans, whether it be during Christmas or whenever, our plans may not be exactly what God has planned For us. In the fourth chapter of James, starting with verse 13, we see, You say today or tomorrow we will go to this city or to that city, and we will spend a year there carrying on business and making money. Well, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist. You're here for a little while, and then you're vanished. You're here, and then you're gone. That's what life, James compares life to being just like a vapor or a mist. I can't tell you. I cannot even begin to count the number of times that my life or my plans have been interrupted. I used to get up in the mornings, and I'd make a to-do list of all the things I wanted to do. 
the things I wanted to get accomplished that day. I don't even do that anymore. I may jot down some things, but so many times I get interrupted. I get pulled in one direction or another, and all because God has other plans for me. I have, I have a, something in my mind laid out. A lot of times God has something else. So I'm saying that our best laid out plans are subject to interruption. Now, our best laid out plans, being subject to interruption, is not always a bad thing. Because what I have lined out may not be nearly as good, may not be nearly as important or nearly as significant as the things that God has laid out for me. Now, the second survival tip that I'd like to give you is try, try to get God's take on the interruption. Okay, God, what are you trying to show me? What are you trying to do to get my attention? How are you speaking in this particular situation? You know, Joseph could have really blown this one. I mean, think about Joseph. Just walk in his sandals there for a few minutes, okay? Think about what's going on in his mind with all that's going on with this woman that he was betrothed to, that he was engaged to. And Joseph's knee-jerk reaction was to divorce Mary. In fact, we see that there in verse 19. Joseph could have embarrassed her. He could have disgraced her socially. Do you know that Joseph could have had Mary executed because she was pregnant out of wedlock in that day and time? And then we see all these other things unfolding in the last five verses there. Joseph was able to get God's take on this matter. Now, who named? Who named Jesus? Joseph. And we're told that right there. He, Joseph, named Jesus. Now, now two things were unfolding here as, as I look at it. I try to look at that whole story and just try to put myself uh, in, in that situation and try to get the feel of what's going on. He got to marry his sweetheart. I think he loved her. No doubt in my mind he loved her. No doubt in my mind that she loved him. But then another thing that we certainly don't need to forget. He must have been honored to have been chosen to raise God's only begotten son. What an honor that would be. So consider God's take. That's what Joseph did. When we look at verse 20 there, now many times, most of us, well, think about this, Many times, most of us won't even consider seeing God's hand in our interruptions. And we talk about it, well, I was going to do this, and I just couldn't get it done. It just didn't happen. We, we blame it on circumstances or situations, not realizing. Let's just step back a minute. Let's look at God's take on this. Yes, there's an interruption. Is God speaking? Is God saying, God have a lesson for us? See, we see those plans that have had to be dashed or those next ideas as being some kind of a disappointment or defeat or even failure. When many times God is at work in ways that we haven't even opened our eyes to see how he might be at work. So I think there's three words right here, simple words, that can get us through these plans that may have been interrupted and yet God is at work. First step is simple. It may be a simple step. I'm not sure that we spend much time doing enough of this. Pray. Stop and pray. Stop and pray. Now you're in church. You're supposed to say you're praying. How much time do you really spend stopping and praying. You know, I tell you that I drive down the road a lot and I'm praying and I'm doing something else and I'm praying. I like that. But there still needs to be time as I sat right here this morning before while some of you all were still snoring, I imagine. And just stopping. Being quiet, being still. And praying. 
Stop and pray. What do we need to pray for? We need to pray for courage. Lord knows I need to pray for wisdom. I've never had enough of that on my own. I don't think you do either. We need to be praying to God for that. We, we pray to God for guidance. Pray to God for help, for his leadership. But we need to just pray. Pray God's will be done. And then the second is perspective. Put this interpretation in its proper perspective. Looking at it as God sees it. And we need to just ask ourselves, now how bad is this situation really? We see some situations we think are so bad, and in the whole scheme of things, they really don't amount to a hill of beans. Sometimes we tend to be catastrophic in our thinking. I mean, we'll spend $100 worth of worry on a $5 problem. We're spending useless time, useless efforts, worrying about things. But we need to be focusing in on something else. So what if the bathtub didn't, doesn't get scrubbed before the company comes over? Or so what if the den doesn't get vacuum caring before we have somebody coming over? See, my, my, my message to you, my message to myself is, let's not spend $100 worth of worry on a $2 problem. So many times. That's exactly what we do. Make sure we get the right perspective with what's going on. God's perspective. And then there's that providence. God's providential leading and guiding hand tells me, hey, God's in control. I can't explain a lot of things in life. Can't explain a lot of things in my life. But I do know God is still on his throne. Always has been, always will be. God is in control. He still has the numbers of your hair written down. He knows how many you've got. Nothing has happened. I'm convinced that nothing will ever happen without God knowing it. I remember saying this in another sermon sometime. You know, your day is going to unfold in such a way that God says, oh my goodness, that caught me by surprise. I didn't know that was going to happen to you today. God already knows those things because he's providential. Let's remember the providence of God. And then I think there needs to be something said about knee-jerk reactions to some of the interruptions that come about in life. Maybe if we had better information. Maybe if we had had a more thought-out decision, there wouldn't be that knee-jerk reaction. I'm guilty of that too. A knee-jerk reaction. Something happens, and I'll react to it. It may not be the right way. We see this with Joseph. He has initially there, I think it's in 19, verse 19, that knee-jerk reaction. All right. Mary, my sweetheart, has been with somebody else. She's pregnant. And then we see how God spoke through the Holy Spirit to her. I think it's worth noting that there's a Mrs. Monroe. At least that's what we'll call her. She had five children. One day she came home from the grocery store and she realized that things were quieter in the house than they normally were when she came back home with five kids. She peeked into the living room and all five of her children were sitting there in the living room in a circle. She put her groceries down, went back into the living room to see exactly what was going on. And her five adorable children were playing with five black and white kittens 
or at least they thought they were kittens. They were skunks. And the mother said, run, children, run. So they each pick up one of the kittens and run. And again, she's screaming, run, children, run. And she squeaked, the, each one of the kids squeezed the skunks. Well, I don't know if you know anything about skunks. Now, Karen and I do. Skunks don't like to be squeezed, okay? Now, the moral to this story is when we face the interruptions in life, when we have our plans, our own agenda that's been dashed, we have to be careful. Don't react with feelings. Don't react with emotions. Because when we do, we have the potential to squeeze the skunk. And that raises a pretty big stink. I thought about uh, another talking last week about my dad and all of his sayings. I thought of another one this week that is pretty apropos at this point. He would say, never wrestle with a pig. You both get dirty, but the pig enjoys it. Never wrestle with a pig. You both get dirty, but guess what? The pig enjoys getting dirty. See, our life doesn't always go as expected. And chances are, our perfect little plans, whether it be for Christmas or something else, may have some interruptions. Karen, working on this, I thought about me. Everything going on with your mother right now and the family. There's some interruptions there in life. And it's, it's a big interruption. Uh, a lot of issues. But you know, God is still in control. Pray, perspective, and the providential hand of God we need to see. Okay, so we've looked at two survival tips to get us through what we like to call and refer to as the most wonderful time of the year, whether it really is for everybody or not. Just a reminder, realize there is a possibility that any of our plans at any given time can be interrupted. But make sure we take God's plans into consideration. See him at work. When God disrupts our plans, guess what? He's trying to accomplish his own. When God disrupts our plans, he's got a plan himself that he's trying to accomplish in our lives and through our lives. So I hope that you and I will see those plans that many times are dashed as an opportunity from God for us to grow spiritually. Having said all that, there's really two choices that any of us have. We can let those interruptions surprise us. We can get all down and discouraged and we can make life miserable for ourselves and others. Or, or we can realize that our plans may not be God's plans, but God is working. And he has his own plan to accomplish in our own lives. Let me close with a view from the zoo. Came across this this past week. Have no idea who Gary Richmond is, but he tells a rather intriguing story. He tells about the birth of a giraffe. I've never seen a giraffe being born. But the first thing to emerge in the process of delivering that calf, that giraffe, and very much like a cow. I mean, I grew up on a farm. You know, the hooves come out first, if it comes out right, the way it's supposed to, and, and then the head. And then 
in a few minutes, that little plunky newborn meets the world, is hurled out into this big, cruel world, falls about 10 feet, and in all probability, that giraffe will land on its back, the baby giraffe. Now, within seconds, he rolls over and gets in an upright position with his legs tucked under his body. Just try to get that, that image there. And from this position, that little creature, just a few seconds old, is emerged out there in the world, and he begins to shake himself. It gets more interesting. The mother giraffe lowers her head enough to take a quick look. And then something, I would say unlikely, I would say unreasonable, begins to happen. She swings her long, pendulous legs outward and kicks her baby. Actually kicks that baby. If it doesn't get up, then that mother will repeat the process over and over again. The struggle for that little baby to, 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 to get up and to rise up is momentous. The mother will kick it again to stimulate that little calf's effort to get up. And finally, the calf is at the point where for the first time it's standing on its own wobbly legs. And then she kicks it one more time. This is true. You can see the video, okay? Why? Because that mother wants that baby to remember how to get up, how to stand on your own four feet, two for us, and to stay with the herd because it's going to be important for that little one to remain in the safety of the others. There's lions, there's tigers, there's hyenas, there's leopards, there's wild hunting dogs out there that enjoy eating baby giraffes. So that giraffe better be quick better be quick on its feet now if the mother didn't teach her young to get up quickly and to get on with it and to get in and be a part of the crowd that young calf's life would be in jeopardy now folks we we wind up getting a lot of kicks in life don't we when we get kicked, we think it's to hurt us. I'm sure that a fat calf could really think, and that calf is thinking, Mom, what are you doing? That mom knows what she's doing. And it's for the betterment, for the safety, for the well-being of that baby giraffe. See, I'm reminded of what Romans 8.28 says. All things doesn't say some or most. All things work together for the good to those that love the Lord and those that are called according to his purpose. All things, all those kicks, and all those times we get knocked down, we get the props knocked out from under us in life. All things work together for the good. If we really do love the Lord and we really are called according to his purpose, that's a promise we need to claim. Okay, so my last thought, my last question is this. How are you going to survive the next three or four weeks? So hectic. Maybe we need to broaden that question. If your life is like mine, maybe we need to ask the question, how are we going to survive life? So I think God sometimes kicks us to get us on our feet, to get us going, 
He does it because he loves us. He does it to protect us. He does it because he wants the best for us. And through it all, we can grow in a maturity in our relationship with the Lord. Let's pray. Anybody can do anything. It's all right. There's not going to be a day of accountability.